Welcome back, Chappelle. All right, let's go ahead and jump straight into where we left off in class. Great classes today that we had, actually. Also, C, D period, G. I'm sure you're going to be awesome, just like you always are, right? Big shout out to G period. You've been killing the game lately. You're quiet, but it's okay. It's a good quiet. Um, big things, though. We talked about a lot of stuff today in class. We mainly talked about uh, the post Persian War Greeks, right? Talked about them cleaning up after this whole thing. Talked about the effect of the Delian League, right? But the big thing we talked about in class today was the age of Pericles, right? And the dramatic governmental reforms of Pericles, right? We discussed how he had the Parthenon built and the Statue of Athena built. And we also discussed all this other shenanigans. I gotta check my text. Yes! All right, so now, anyway. But the big thing about this whole thing, though, is he had government workers paid created equal elections, free theater seats for the poor, and he did this while being elected to Archon nine, 29 times in a row. Now, granted, he was one of nine other Archons every single time, but still, being elected 29 times to do anything is pretty flippin' impressive when you think about it. So the age of Pericles is looked, up, looked upon as the age of reforming democratic systems, creating more fair government systems, and creating a more balanced society within the structure of ancient Athens, right? And as we also know that this is considered sometimes at the amphitheater, there's the mask we looked at in class today, as we know that this is sometimes referred to as a golden age, right? The opposite of that dark age we talked about. So we are now currently talking about classical Greece, right? So the age of Pericles is in classical Greece, right? And that is considered a time of great cultural prosperity. Uh, growth of the Athenian Empire and expansion. They are going to create more colonies and grow. So everything here in green is actually going to represent things that Athens controlled or members that were actually a part of the Delian League or also Athenian cities and Athenian islands that they expanded to use with their naval fleet, right? So the big thing, though, some people would actually argue that Athens is getting a little too big for their britches. They're growing too much. They are too large. And they have all this new theater and art and jobs and great economy which flourishes under them. But the entire time that this is going on, who is this driving nuts? Who would look at this map right here and believe that Athens is not actually doing great things, but they are instead a threat, right? That they are a threat, that they are growing too large, too fast, that their theater and art is just a masquerade for their economy, that they're stealing from other people and doing all these ridiculous things. Who would think that? Who is that going to make angry? Sparta, right? Sparta is becoming more and more furious as time goes on. Because of all this growth and their prosperity, and also because it's creating more and more and more democratic reforms that can be used in Athens, that'll give people more rights, and the Spartans don't like it because it goes directly against their cultural values of cultural hegemon hege hegemony, hege hegemony, cultural ubiquity throughout their entire thing based on military rank and service, right? So Sparta is getting very, very upset. Now, the big thing, though, you also have to kind of understand is that we are going to come back to that feud with Sparta here in the end. But we also have to talk about kind of like some different things, too, that like, yes, classical Athens seems great. And yes, classical Athens seems super positive. But the big thing you got to know, too, is that life in Periclean Athens might have been good for the Athenian, regular Athenian. But they weren't like rolling around in gold and stuff. This is actually the design of what we believe a Periclean or classical Athens home would have looked like. They would have lived with few things, right? They would have had a lot of things inside their home. Whenever you walked into the entrance of an Athenian home, there was usually an altar with a courtyard inside of it where that altarpiece was dedicated to the god that that family wanted to pray to as often as possible. For example, if I had a house like this built for myself and I had a god, a god altar, mine would probably be, I don't know, Demeter's pretty dope. I like Demeter a lot. Um, also, I'm a big fan of Hades. I like Hades a lot. He's not actually a bad guy. He actually is just doing his job. You know what I mean? But my family would have an altar to that right there for prayers and offerings and things like that. And then also you would have a storeroom or a shop, a dining room as well, which they didn't have tables that they actually sat at. Whenever Greeks ate, they actually ate laying down. They actually ate laying down on their backs because everything they could eat, they could eat with their hands, right? So they could just be like, ah, rah, rah, rah. so the other big thing though is they would have a store, a kitchen, and they would also usually have a storeroom or a shop. Now, up here in the bedrooms, there would usually be a husband's bedroom and a wife's bedroom. Now, we'll get to that whole thing in a second, but there's some sketchy stuff kind of living out through Periclean Athens because Periclean Athens wasn't perfect, right? So most men crafted or worked with their hands. Also, slavery was very commonplace in Athens, right? So that's a big thing you got to understand is we look back on Athens and refer to it as a golden age, but there were still things about it that we don't like, right? There's still the fact that Athenians and Athens in general 
condoned the use of slavery, which is very, very upsetting. And they also were super rude to women, which we'll get here in about two seconds. But also, Athenians outside the city kept like animals for meat and our milk and meat and things like that. And typically speaking, you would actually keep those outside of your home, right? Now, going forward, though, speaking of gender in classical Athens is also like, again, a very loaded concept, right? Because Athens was doing so great, and yes, they were going through a golden age, and yes, Pericles was super positive, and yes, all these great things were occurring, but women were not respected in Athens the same way that they were in Sparta. Women were not allowed to participate in politics. They could not hold political office. A woman could not even represent herself in a court of law, right? If a law was broken and against a woman in Athens and she needed to actually have the law on her side and something fixed, she wasn't even allowed to represent herself there. A man had to go and represent her in a court because the main view of women was to produce children and that's super screwed up, right? Just because it's a golden age doesn't mean everything's great, okay? So also on the whole flip side of it, they weren't allowed to leave their house. And the only time they were allowed to leave their house or even seen in public eyes was during religious, religious ceremonies. If a city or an area in Athens was having a religious ceremony dedicating it to a female goddess, they believed that they they needed women there and that women were necessary in that vein. But that's super screwed up that you're not allowing women to actually exist in society. And it actually led to a lot of other really messed up things when it comes to things that were accepted in ancient Athens, okay? And we'll talk about those things in class. Men dominated the political scene completely. They went to the Agora because women were not allowed in it. And they also ran the military. So everything that existed in common day society, whenever you walked outside, all you saw in ancient Athens was men. Like, and, and boys learning how to become apprentices or to a master of a certain craft or something like that. Which, like I said, is going to lead to a lot of really, really screwed up stuff. Because you cannot have a society where you're shunning women away or else things will become accepted in their society that are not acceptable, right? So, now, really, really quick, though, going forward is also that you need to understand is lastly that classical Greece was the age of the great philosophers, right? So although everything negative was going on in the background, women were being uh, subjugated, slavery was still a very big thing, even though like reforms were going on and government was becoming better and the theater was becoming better and things were happening for the regular man in Athens, one of the biggest things that kind of shakes the bedrock of Western civilizations is the creation of the philosophic construct that actually was created in Greece, right? Now, philosophers had existed before these guys, right? There have been philosophers as long as there have been humans, but asking questions that you just quite can't understand or answer, right? Philosophy, in a nutshell, in Latin, actually means a lover of wisdom. And so philosophers, the big three philosophers anyway in ancient Greece, are going to begin to turn away from the myths... And they're going to actually start analyzing some other things, right? They're going to start analyzing different ideas, different concepts, different understandings of different events, right? They're going to start saying, are we sure that a god carries the sun across the sky or is there another answer, right? Don't accept the things that you've been fed your whole life. The first one to come along is this guy. He is the original big three philosopher. His name is Socrates, right? So you have three big philosophers. You got Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, right? The very first one, Socrates, was actually born very, very poor, right? Born to a very poor family and actually never wrote anything down. Possibly could have been illiterate for all we know. May have not been able to read or write. Now, probably more than likely, though, not the case. More than likely, he could read and could write because the chances of him being able to create a philosophic mindset without the ability to read and write is very slim. Now, he taught, though, for free in the Agora, and apparently he only ever wore one set of clothes that he would never wash, right? So apparently he probably smelled really bad. So he would talk for free for Agora, though, and literally walk up to random Athenians and ask them questions. He's like, are you sure that you know the things that you know? Why are you doing this? Why must we function in this economy? Why must we do all these different things? And he asked, like, What's the meaning of life? Is getting anything perfect actually perfect? Is perfection possible? Because that's his big thing. If you haven't noticed yet, Socrates' biggest thing is constantly asking questions, right? The Socratic method is constantly about analyzing the things you believe that you know and also analyzing your personal self so that you can reach true happiness, right? For example, he's got a lot of very, very famous quotes, right? So one of his most famous guiding quotes is, All I know is that I know nothing. So basically, in a nutshell, Socrates believed that no one knows anything for sure, right? He also said, know thyself, right? Know thyself in the sense of know thyself, your limitations, 
that you're imperfect, that you need to grow, that we don't understand everything around us. And he began to lead a lot of Athenians into this idea of questioning everything about society. Is our government good? Is our government bad? Is our religion good? Is our religion bad? Is our religion true or is it fake? And we've just created these myths to understand things better and things like that. And so with that sense, he became known as the gadfly of Athens. Now what a gadfly is, is a pesty little fly that keeps flying around horses and you always wanna slap it away, right? So, so basically a lot of politicians like Pericles started looking at Socrates being like, this guy's a sketch bag, right? He's asking a lot of different stuff. He's leading our children to negative thoughts. He is actually re leading us to religious impiety and he's doing a lot of other things that we're not fans of, right? So what ends up happening is, unfortunately, in 399 BC, Socrates would be executed. And this is a very, very famous painting of that by Jacques-Louis David. And in this painting, you can see Socrates right here, who is about to die. And he actually had a chance to run away during this period. He could have actually ran into exile and lived the rest of his life, but he decided to stay and defend his ideas. And they killed him by forcing him to drink Poison hemlock, right? So they legit actually made a poison of hemlock root, right? Hemlock is spelled H-E-M-L-O-C-K. Hemlock is legit the stuff that they boiled it into a poison and he had to drink it and it ended up killing him, right? And right here at the base of his bed is his one of his most famous students who watched him die and recorded everything he ever said. And that guy's name is Plato. Not Plato is in Plato, Plato is in Plato, right? So Plato was actually the second philosopher to come along, the second of the big three, and he took Socrates' ideas of constant questioning and he expanded on them, right? As the student of Socrates, he wrote down and recorded every single idea or concept that actually Socrates would put forward. But the big difference between these two guys is that Plato was born wealthy, right? Plato was born wealthy to a very wealthy family and managed to avoid military service and actually became a student of Socrates, right? He wrote down all of his thoughts and theories and various works, and what I say, mean by wrote down all of his, when I say his, I mean Socrates, right? And so he becomes, effectively, the philosopher that is considered the father of rationalism, right? So Plato took all of Socrates' ideas of do we really know anything and tried to create a concept of answering that, that whole, like, rationality, right? And rationalism is the concept of using reason and logic to solve anything, right? So, for example, people began to ask Plato, where does everything come from? Where is everything going? Do we know of a higher power? If we're not believing in the gods anymore, do we believe in anything? And one of the biggest things he comes up with is this, the theory of forms, right? So the theory of forms is the concept that Plato basically believed that there were two separate universes, right? Two different universes, and that we live in what is known as the real universe, right? And in the real universe, there are all these goofy imitations of garbage, right? So basically it's like, okay, here's, who am I gonna use right now? Here's Cameron Kennedy, right? And then here is Caitlin, what's your last name? Oh, La, La Rocca, right? Ah, there's another one. Well, like, as you can see, we have tons of different girls that go to this school and they all look a little bit different and they look a little bit like different from one another and they're all very different. Well, according to Plato, though, all of these people are projections of a perfect woman that lives in this place, right? That everything that exists in this real universe is based off of the universe that occurs known as the universe of the forms, right? Where everything's original form exists. So basically all these versions are garbage imitations of this perfect woman. And there's perfect versions of everything. There's the perfect like chair in the theory of forms. There's the perfect apple that exists is this an apple? Yeah, ooh, hey, that's not that bad. Perfect apple in this place. And then every version of it here is just hot garbage, right? It's just a cheap imitation of this perfect universe. But the big thing that Plato is expanding on is the idea of that is that there's another universe or a alternate universe, or there's this idea of a heavenly universe, right? So he's kind of encouraging the ideas in the very first times in Western civilization 
of this concept of where everything comes from, right? Where do we all come from? And his idea was this theory of forms, that there's this universe, the forms universe, and that this is the real one, right? Like, for example, he'd be like, oh, there's a perfect cat. And no, actually, there's no such thing as a perfect cat. So there's like a dog here, and then there's my dog, which is actually very, very close to the real, like, perfect dog. And then there's my wife's dog, who's like way down here and is absolutely high garbage. So, like, and then he also came up with a lot of other stuff, like the allegory of the cave, which we'll talk about tomorrow a little bit in class, right? So Plato is this guy of rationalism, right? What does Plato solve things with? His brain, right? He basically tries to think his way around everything. Aristotle, though, is a little bit different. Rationalism is the concept of using logic to solve problems. Aristotle believed that you can use evidence to solve problems, right? He is a student and peer of Plato, and Plato actually educated Aristotle inside of this place called Plato's Academy. Plato actually even created an academic place where actually it was considered a place to go and learn, right? He came from this wealthy family, so he created literally a school where he would go and teach all these different things. Jump back to Plato really quick and write Plato's Academy, right? Right underneath like the, the Republic. So he basically created the very first like westernized school of philosophy. Aristotle was a student and peer at that school, and he believes in a lot of different things, like moderation, right? He believes that everything needs to be done in moderation and everyone will be fine. He also taught ethos, logos, and pathos. The, guy, the ideas of using these three things in either writing or your life will actually lead to a better and more balanced life, right? Ethos is your ethics or your trustworthiness. Lo logos is using logic to understand the world around you. And pathos is the concept of using sympathy, right? We actually use these three things mostly now in English, right? I'm sure Miss Savoy will be bringing up ethos, logos, and pathos any day now to talk to you about the concept of Aristotelian writing and the concept of using these ideas is when you're writing a convincing argument, right? He also is considered, though, the father of empiricism, right? So, for example, uh, he used empirical evidence. So basically, Aristotle wanted to believe that you can only learn from observing something that has occurred, right? So by using empiricism, for example, I know that when you drop an item, it comes to the ground, right? So I know that there's some force acting on it, but look, I'm observing this force right now, right? I am observing that this thing can bounce and this one does not bounce as big. So I have to figure out what makes these things different and why they do the things they do, right? That's empirical learning. For example, uh, Aristotle believed that the the earth was in the middle of the universe and everything went around us, but that's because he wouldn't know any better, right? Because he can't feel the earth moving and the sun is moving around, so he based his observation of his ideas on that, right? Now, granted, Aristotle was wrong about 90% of the things that he actually said in a modern scientific idea, but he at least introduced the concept of empirical learning, right? He also was really sexist and said that women were half of men, but that's really messed up. Now, anyway, so the big thing about the philosophers, though, is their impact. The impact of the philosophers is the idea that we should use observation as a way to understand the world, not assumed truths, right? So basically, in a nutshell, the, uh, the uh, philosophers created this, like, this kind of whole understanding and this foundational idea behind this concept of, like, oh, I will never assume that I know anything. I need to seek it out and try to understand it better. And the best thing you can do is question all of those ideas, right? So now that is all different stuff when it comes to what you call it, uh, classical Athens, right? That is all classical Athenian architecture, understanding, and Periclean ideals, right? Now, the big thing, though, is at the end of the classical period, sending us into what is known as the Hellenistic period, you're going to see a major event happen known as the Peloponnesian War. So go ahead and like make a line in your notes. We're now moving on to a new subject, right? You're going to need to know your three big philosophers. We'll talk about them in class and review them a lot. And then we just got to dive straight in to Alexander the Great and his family, right? The Peloponnesian War, though, is huge, okay? So all the while, while classical Athens is producing Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Pericles and theater and all this and that and the other, a massive 27-year-long war is going to break out, right? So basically, who was mad at Athens this entire time? Oh, yeah, that's right. Those guys that live down the street, the Spartans, right? So the Spartans finally decide that they've had enough of Athens crap, right? They're decided that they are sick of it. Then they're especially sick of this thing, right? They are sick of the Delian League and the expansion of Athens. And they're disgusted by this continued growth and this basically this long running chain that they keep creating. It actually really came down to starting because of a trade debacle, right? Where literally there was this one smaller city state named Magar and then there was another large one in Corinth and those two started having a battle against each other and Athens 
entered in onto the side of Corinth, and basically Sparta was like, you can't do that. Don't be coming and bothering them. You're just trying to like eat your garbage all over everybody else, right? And so Sparta decides they've had enough of Athens and its Delian League and their navy, and they want to create their own league. And so Sparta created a league out of everyone that hated Athens, and they called it the Peloponnesian League. Isn't that right? Fortado, right? Fortado knows that word Peloponnesian, right? She knew it really well. So Sparta creates its Peloponnesian League, right? And it has a massive land army. And they decide to go to war, and as you can see, it lasted for 27 years years, right? 27 years means that this war resulted in what's known as a stalemate, right? A stalemate is basically when neither side is winning. So every single time they'd have a battle, maybe Sparta would win that battle, but they just kept banging into each other, banging into each other, and nobody could seem to get a clear-cut victory. And there were periods on and off of peace and stuff like that. Sparta tried to blockade Athens using their land army. Athens tried to blockade Sparta using their navy, and it went back and forth and back and forth. But then finally, Sparta actually allies with the Persians? What? Yeah, the same people that they had several wars with, because the Persians were still disgusted that Athens had been a part of beating them in those two wars, so they borrowed Persia's naval fleet, and they actually won the Peloponnesian War. But the thing about this war is that this entire conflict left southern Greece destroyed. Sparta was like in a mess. Athens was a wreck. All of the different allies that allied with either side went to war with one another, and it was in shambles, right? So the thing about it is, if all of southern Greece is not able to defend themselves anymore, that means that another outside force can enter in. And that force is going to be known as Alexander the Great, and it's going to lead to the last time period we'll talk about, the Hellenistic period, right? Now, the thing about this whole concept is you got to understand one thing out the gate. Alexander is not even the first guy we're going to start talking about. We're actually going to start talking about where he's from and his dad, right? So Alexander the Great is not from Athens. He's not from Sparta. He's not from Corinth. He's not from Thebes. He's not from any of those places. He's actually from a place called Macedonia, right? And Macedonia is a mountainous region in Greece that is to the north, right? So this is the Republic of Macedonia up here. Sparta would have been located down here. Athens was located right here, right? Thebes is located right there, and a bunch of those larger city-states that just were in that Peloponnesian War were all located in the southern area. Macedonia, on the other hand, is all the way up here. And Macedonia is considered a bunch of uncivilized frontier people, right? They are mountain people that are not organized into these big city-states. They do not have grand columns and big architecture and philosophy. They're just people trying to survive in this frontier. But they do have a leader, right? And they have a king, and the king of Macedonia was a man named Philip II, right? Philip II is a prominent figure in Macedonian history and in ancient Greek history. Philip II was a fantastic general and warrior. Philip II was also a fantastic leader of militaries, right? And a great leader of men. And he's the king of Macedonia, and he decides that he wants to create and take the chance to use the like chaos that southern Greece has been in, and he wants to bring Macedonia to power, right? Philip II is the father of of Alexander the Great, and he decides that he wants to conquer Greece following the Peloponnesian War. Now, why would you choose to do it then? Why would you choose to go out and try to conquer Greece after the Peloponnesian War? The reason being is because they've just gone through this war. They are not ready to defend themselves. So Philip decides that this is his moment, and we will talk about that stuff tomorrow in class. I'll see y'all then.